Welcome to the fourth AFNI bootcamp video on the subject of functional MRI time series regression. Now I'm going to talk about variable shape models instead of the previous talk, which is about fixed shape human dynamic response models. The alternative to a fixed shape is to have no con particular constraint on the hemodynamic response function shape. And this is accomplished in AFNI by the use of basis function expansions. The simplest basis function is a, called a tent, mostly because of the profile that looks kind of like a cartoon model of a, uh, of a little Boy Scout tent. And what happens is multiple tent functions, the triangle shown below, are set at equally spaced locations in time to cover the potential bold response period. And each of these things is called a basis function. The basis functions are combined to produce the overall shape. The mm -hmm. human response function is a sum of these basis functions, each of which gets its own beta weight, saying how much of it is included. And the tents are sometimes called piecewise linear splines because there are more advanced things called cubic splines and so on, which I'll discuss briefly later. So the sum of ten functions is actually pretty much the same thing as something you've learned about before in your life. I hope, linear interpolation. In this cartoon example, there are five equally spaced 10 functions uh, that, are, that are spaced L units apart in time. And the, the points where the, these 10 functions are defined are called the knots in the theory of splines. And so we have a knot at L, 2L, 3L, 4L, 5L seconds. And then the 10 function Expansion is beta 1 times a 10 function that's centered at time L, uh, beta 2 times a 10 function that's centered at time 2L, and so on. You add those up, those triangles up, and you get a, a, a broken line segment thing that looks like linear interpolation. So the 10 output beta parameters are easily interpreted as the function value. For example, beta 2 is the response at time 2 times L after the stimulus onset. The relationship of the tent spacing L and the TR should be, L should be bigger than TR because it doesn't really make sense to try and resolve shape details finer than a TR. Uh, and it should usually be an integer multiple of TR. So it could be if TR was 2 seconds, it could be L would be 2 or L would be 4. In FNI Park Pi, you choose to use a tent function by using the, the model. Instead of block, you use tent 0, indicating that it's 0 at the ends. And, uh, and the duration D, and N is the number of knots. So there are... Uh, the L spacing between the knots is D, their duration D divided by N minus 1, and there are N minus 2 full tents. Each tent overlaps about half a tent, exactly half a tent length with its two neighbors. So, for example, if D was 12 seconds, you picked L was 2, and you, and you N the 7, you'd have tent zero, of zero, tent 0 of 0, 12, and 7. And the basis functions create the human dynamic response function, the shape, both the, both the shape and the size. The, the HRF, of course, is copied for all stimulus of the same type. And in this example, the HRF has five parameters to be estimated. And the betas determine the size, the amplitude, because a bigger beta means the whole the thing goes up. And the shape, a big beta at the beginning and a small beta at the end, means the shape is big at the beginning and dies off faster, and vice versa. If the shape, the beta for the first TR uh, knot is small and the last one is big, then the thing rises through time. And of course, every voxel and every subject gets a different HRF shape now, not just a separate size and amplitude. And if there are multiple types of tasks, each task that uses tens would get a different shape as well. And in AFNI, the stimulus times don't need to be on the TR grid. The tent shape allows for that. Why is it called tent zero BCN? The zero means that the hemodynamic response function goes to zero at the beginning and the, at the end of the time intervals, which is between time between the first argument B and the second argument C. There's no response 
just after the start B or just after the end C. If you want there to be a response at the beginning and at the end, you use tent without tent zero. B means the start of the response is B seconds after the stimulus time. Usually B is zero, but the program allows you to put in a negative B, for example, to allow for pre-stimulus anticipation. That can occur if you have a task which, for example, says to the subject, go ahead and press this button anytime you want, you know, once every 10, 20 seconds. So then you measure the times that the buttons didn't press, so you know those times, but of course there was something going on in their brain before they pressed the button, and so you might want to set B to be, say, minus 2 or minus 3 seconds or something like that. Perfectly allowed. C means the end of the response is C seconds after the stimulus time, not C seconds after B, C seconds after the stimulus time. So C has to be bigger than B because otherwise you're trying to run things backward and the program does, doesn't like you. And N is the number of splots, knots in this point. So remember from the previous talk, the fixed shaped hemodynamic response function for 20 second block design looks like this. This is the block response repeat, repeated 10 times across this imaging run. If we did the same thing with the same stimulus time with, with tents like this, we would have this. The, we'd have tent 0, 0 to 26. It was 26, 20 second long stimulus and we allowed 6 seconds for it to die off. So we have tent running from 0 to 26 seconds at time and we put in four, 14, uh, 14 Knots, and so we end up with the bottom tw 12 gra subgraphs are the graphs of the tent functions. And then the top one I threw in as the sum of all, of all of those things. And you can see how the shape is manufactured by adding them up. And you can compare that to the more curved shape from, that we get with the, with the block shape function. But that's because we added in all the betas, the betas for each one of these things. We just set to 1. In the same uh, time series are presented in the form of the matrix image that was shown last time. And we see how we get the going down each column is one regressor in time. And then across the 12 columns are the different 12 different blocks and 12 different tents, I mean. And we see that they, they're the same thing, just slightly diagonally shifting down in time. And this. These graphs were produced with this script, which you can download from the AFNI website. So a somewhat more real example, which is from a paper by Mike Beauchamp, uh, where we had he had 10 imaging runs, 136 time points per run, TR two seconds. So it's a lot, fair amount of data. He had two different, he had two factors and four different kinds of stimuli. There were the, there were the two factors were human images versus tool images. And the form in these videos was a real image of a person or a tool versus a point outline done with motion capture. And then so it was a two by two design. And so there are images of tools moving, like I say, a hammer pounding, or people moving, walking, or sitting, or something like that. And then, then there were point outlines for each of these things, too. And the goal was to find brain areas that distinguish natural motions. Uh, human movie and human point from simple rigid motions like tool like tools move. And here's some example videos. The videos are two seconds long, and in a real experiment, this the uh, the videos don't repeat. The person sees a video for two seconds. So then there are a lot of questions that can be asked in a two by two design. Uh, point point like motion point mo outline motion versus natural motion um, human motion versus tool motion uh, and so on. Now in this analysis, this uh, uh, Dr. Beauchamp decided that he would use this deconvolution approach. This is deconvolution because we're trying to find the shape via regression. This is deconvolution because. The response function is normally thought of as the folding together of the impulse response function with the stimulus timing, and now we're, we're, on, we're going backwards and trying to find the impulse response function to each individual stimulus by, by regression. 
So here's what the design matrix for his analysis looks like. He has 10 imaging runs, remember. So there are three quad, there's a polynomial, three order polynomial for each of 10 runs. So there's 30 columns in the, in, in the polynomial part on the left of the matrix. And then in the middle of the matrix are the, uh, the slanted down lines that correspond to four different kinds of uh, event stimuli. And the reason the lines tend to look broken up is simply that the matrix is so lengthy that showing it as an image requires subsampling it and it becomes uh, a little bit uh, pixelated. And then on the right are the regressors due to subject motion estimates. And here's the result. Here's his results, or some of his results. This is the example of human motion, that is the, the outline of human motion and the real human motions, minus the the tool motions, the simple motions, either in real video or in outline video. And the blue HRF curve is the result from the human human videos human movement videos, and the red HRF, which is the lower one, are the tool videos. Now in this example, you can actually see that the shapes were pretty much the same, and modeling them with a block might have worked just as well. But he didn't know that ahead of time, which is why he carried out the analysis here. You could also see that he actually did get a, a distinct result that, that uh, there are parts of the brain that are more sensitive to complex naturalistic motion. So what's the approach good at? Usually you can use for event-related designs this approach because if a single event, maybe a complicated event like a video or even a, some sort of thing that is a video and then a choice about the video, so it may take several seconds for the event to play out, where because if you put a whole bunch of blocks of events together rapidly and make it a, a block design, bang, 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 then those, the shape differences are going to tend to average out because of the sun, because things just combine and you really can't find shapes of the individual events at all. One thing you could allow for would be to for within block attenuation in time if you think that's a problem. But remember, you don't want to analyze stuff just because something might happen. You have to have a reason. To, to analyze your, your data in a certain way. Otherwise, you'll spend your entire life analyzing one collection of data. You, another reason is that young versus old subjects may have different uh, hemodynamic response due to different uh, uh, the evolution of our uh, blood vessel system as we age. Um, we might look for differences in between conditions and tasks, especially if you have one of these complicated decision-making tasks kind of things that I, that I mentioned. Or you might look for differences in shape between brain regions. You will usually get a better model fit, because even in the previous experiment where there wasn't a lot of shape difference between the two tasks, it didn't go up and down quite as fast as a block, block design or rather the block model did, and so that it would, uh, maybe it's a better fit this way. It's usually more, statistically more powerful on test significance unless you use too many betas. If you try to fit the curve shape too, too powerfully, too, too, too many uh, knots, making the, the spacing between the regressors too, too short. And an another caveat, which I don't have a bullet point for, is that if you do this kind of basis function regression, you almost always need to have randomly spaced in time events because otherwise the uh, betas from one, the tail of the beta from event number one will overlap with the head of the betas from number two and you'll get uh, a non-identifiability or a multicollinearity. However, the approach is not very popular. It's difficult to combine the individual results at group level. I mean, now instead of having one amplitude per, uh, per subject, per, per task, you have perhaps 10. How do you combine that? There is an AFNI program for this called 3 MVM, but it's not commonly used. And you have more regressions than simple, simpler alternatives, so that if they weren't needed, you're sacrificing degrees of freedom, that is statistical precision, to estimate something that is of no value. And this is why you probably need to randomize the stimulus timing to avoid this multicollinearity. And overfitting, if you, if 
you you may end up picking up head head motion, stimulus correlated head motion sometimes. That is, uh, we have seen that effect happen. So you need to examine your model fitting a little more carefully than with the block, with a simple simple block function that gives you one parameter. There is an intermediate approach, and that's uh, what in AFNI we call SPM G123. We use it from the basis functions from the SPM model, which are based on gamma gamma function variates, and we use a principal basis function. That is, the, the like the gamma and AFNI that goes up and down, a simple function, and then you add in a couple of other functions that allow for a little bit of shape variation. The, the SPMG2 allows for a little bit of delay forward or backward in time, and the SPMG3 allows for it to get a little bit wider or narrower. And just blowing that, that image in the last slide up a little bit, we see the, uh, the shape, the canonical one, which is the sort of the thing, the equivalent, the gam with a little bit of undershoot, the temporal derivative, which allows for a little bit of slot back and forth in time for maybe like for a couple of seconds, and dispersion, which allows it to get a little bit wider or, or smaller on a voxel-like basis. We don't usually recommend the use of these functions, but it's certainly possible in AFNI. The AFNI Pi talks show how the details of how you select which basis function used for the HRF. And in a later talk, I'll talk about other basis functions that we have in AFNI that are used in more specialized situations. So suppose you do tense. Then what do you do for your group analysis? As always, the analysis depends on your goals. If your goal is to find activation magnitude differences, as in the Beauchamp study that was outlined previously, and not shape differences, then the simplest thing is to add up the tent betas in each voxel to get sort of an area under the response curve and carry that number to as a single scalar to the, the group level. So that tells you uh, it's still a single scalar, it's just calculated in a somewhat more complicated way than using a single parameter block, uh, block model. And then you carry that, then you can carry a single scalar for each task and each subject to the group level using an AFNI group analysis program such as 3D t-test plus plus or 3D LME. But if your goal is to be sensitive to shape differences, then the program to use in AFNI is called 3D MVM, which is multivariate modeling. This allows for multiple betas in each condition, uh, and you get a multiple condition. You can, MVM is a powerful program with a lot of modeling capability that requires care in use. And there's a lot more on this subject in the group analysis talks in this AFNI series. So thank you, and stay tuned for more.